Hi, and good morning, everyone. I'm Dana Thompson, the director of the Brown Planetarium at Ball State University. And today we are wrapping up our Your Universe series with a talk about astrophysics as, and cosmology and how they can help us understand the origins of your universe. Today, we have a special guest, Dr. Michael Scobie, who's going to be helping us explore all of this. And I'm going to give a quick overview of the entire universe in just about 20 minutes for you all um, before we hear from Michael about some of the experiments that are being done here on planet Earth uh, to help us understand things that are going on or that are have gone on uh, billions of years ago. Uh, so uh, again, welcome everyone. I'm Dana Thompson, the director of the Brown Planetarium at Ball State University, where we have the largest planetarium and wonderful technology uh, to help recreate the sky and bring the universe to our community. But, but today we're gonna be bringing you the universe on a flat screen. Um, and we have some pretty great visuals to help explain some of the content that we're going to be exploring. As with all of our talks, we have Rachel Williamson, our planetarium show specialist with us today, who's gonna to be able to respond to some of your comments in the chat or questions in the chat. And we can also get your questions that you put in the chat to either myself or Dr. Scobie uh, with us today to help um, really engage um, with you on this topic, this topic about the early, uh, that we're talking about, about the early universe. So if you have any questions, any comments, put them in the chat and we hope to hear from you. So this whole series, we've been talking about the universe and uh, this wonderful person, Pablo Budasi, put everything in our universe, well, not everything, but most everything in our universe into one image. So first of all, this image here is not to scale. Uh, the celestial bodies here appear larger than they would compare to each other just to help us appreciate their shape and what they look like. And also, um, we're seeing everything in our huge universe in a very small graphic. So the distances in between these objects are not to scale either. This is represented as a logarithmic scale. And a logarithmic scale is just a way of displaying numerical data, just data, um, like pictures here, over a wide range of values in a compact way. So we're using that since we're spanning large distances and since it takes a lot of time for light from these far away objects to reach us, we're spanning time here in this graphic too. So we have pretty much present day on earth on the left-hand side, and then when we observe far out into our universe, we're not just looking through um, many, many light years of distance, but we're also looking back in a time um, to a time about 13.7 billion years ago when we think our universe formed. And again, that's just because it takes time for objects in space to reach us, traveling through those long distances, um, because it does take time for light to travel from place to place. Uh, we don't usually notice it, but light from the sun uh, takes about eight minutes to reach us here on Earth. Um, farther away objects then takes even longer to reach us. Um, so we're really looking back into time when we're exploring this graphic here. But let's zoom in on a part of this graphic. We're gonna zoom into four pieces of this graphic uh, to help us understand it a little bit better. All right, so this is the left-hand side of the graphic where we're looking at our Earth present day. So um, this is the like what we're familiar with today and the closest things that are around us on our planet Earth too. So we're looking at some of the satellites here in this graphic. We have meteors that come from space as meteoroids. When they get into our atmosphere, they can get heated up due to ram pressure um, and create meteors. And if they make it all the way to Earth, they become meteorites, um, but sometimes they break up in our atmosphere and they don't actually collide with our planet. Um, and so beyond our atmosphere, we have our satellites here. And then we have the closest major natural body to us in space, which is our moon, which is about a quarter of a million miles away. Even farther out, we have other things, but 
we can see our sun here in this graphic, which is about 93 million miles away. And then even farther, we have the asteroid belt, which is about 180 million miles away. So this logarithmic scale, we're really, as we're getting farther away from our planet, we're seeing things appear closer in this graphic here, even though they're much, much farther away in space, okay? So the moon here in this graphic, this is about a quarter of a million miles. Then it jumps logarithmic, logarithmically, excuse me, um, to the sun, which is about 100 million miles away. And then it jumps to about 200 million miles away. So again, we're spanning really large distances. This image goes out to 46 billion light years. And a light year, if you need a quick uh, refresher on that, is about 6 trillion miles. Um, so this just goes on for a very large distance. And we're jumping through distances really quick in this image here. So let's move on what's out past the asteroid belt. If you've been follow following along in our Your Universe series, you might know. Um, that we have the gas giant Jupiter and its moons, um, as well as the gas giant Saturn, and then the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. And beyond that, in the Kuiper belt, we have Pluto, the dwarf planet, one of them in our solar system anyway. There's other dwarf planets too, like Haumea, Makemake, and Eris here. Out even farther, we have the Oort cloud, which we think is where icy comets originate. And then far beyond our solar system, there are other stars, like the closest star to us, Proxima Centauri here, and other stars that are nearby our sun out in space as well. If we go even farther out, we can see more distant stars. And this graphic is imagining them um, kind of stemming from the spiral arm of our Milky Way galaxy that we're a part of called the Perseus arm. And we're likely inside a, a barred spiral. So a spiral galaxy that has an elongated center here or core. Um, and uh, we call it, of course, the Milky Way galaxy. And our galaxy is just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies. And one of the closest spiral galaxies to us out in space is the Andromeda galaxy here, but there are many, many other galaxies to explore in our universe. And as we go out even uh, to the, the far right of the original graphic here, we can see those galaxies and they're uh, appearing to get smaller here just so things can fit a little bit better in this graphic. And when we explore our larger universe, we see the galaxies kind of form a web. So we have this web of galaxies and it forms the structure here that we can see and observe. And then we can explore the first light in our universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation. And then there's kind of a gray area here where we are seeing kind of like the results of the Big Bang or what we can imagine the universe to kind of be like there where things were so close together that actually um, no light could really escape the high densities that were found at that time. So as we travel through um, this graphic, we were going back in time when things were um, a lot closer together, things were more dense. Um, there's higher temperatures too and uh, high pressure too. Um, so when we change temperature and pressure, we know that the states of matter or the matter or the state that matter is in actually could change as well. So uh, let's review the states of matter because when we're exploring the early universe and these high densities, high temperatures, we can um, not we can ha it can be hard to understand uh, what matter is kind of like at these extremes. So what is matter like on Earth? Uh, so we are familiar with the, the basic states of matter that we explore on Earth. We have our solids, we have liquids, and we have gases. And we know that um, for water, um, when we increase temperature of a solid, so ice, it can melt. And we increase temperature even more, we get a gas. Um, so to understand just the extreme temperatures that we can find in the early universe and off of Earth, like in the sun, let's review some of the um, hot things in our universe. 
So when you think of hot things, you might um, immediately think of fire here on Earth. And fire is about 1,000 to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. A blowtorch is even hotter. It's about two times hotter than that. And the surface of the sun is hotter than a blowtorch. It's about two times hotter than that. So thousands of degrees. And the center of the sun is even hotter than that. It's about 28 million degrees Fahrenheit. So the core of the sun is extremely hot and extremely dense. And what does matter behave like in the center of the sun? Well, let's go back and explore um, these states of matter, um, solid, liquid, and gas at a more of a molecular level. So for solids, molecules are moving really slowly, slow enough that the forces between them are holding them in place. And the red circles here are spheres or molecules. And when you add some energy to that, um, you can get a liquid and the molecules kind of begin to go free. And when matter is heated even more, the interactions between the molecules become negligible and the matter turns into a gas where the molecules kind of just bounce around randomly. But Let's zoom in on a single molecule, and in fact, just one atom of that molecule, which contains a nucleus of protons and neutrons that are surrounded by electrons. So in our sun's core, the temperatures are actually so great that the electrons of these atoms get stripped off and they run free. And this makes another state of matter we call plasma. So the sun is made out of plasma. And you can find plasma in fluorescent light bulbs, lightning, and those cool plasma balls that um, we actually use for the for planetarium demo sometimes. But what about even higher temperatures? Because when we're talking about stars, yes, we have millions of degrees, but um, there's even hotter things um, like the early universe was much hotter than that. Uh, so at even higher temperatures, something can happen to the atom's nucleus. And an atom's nucleus, remember, is made out of neutrons and protons. Together, we can call them nucleons. So these nucleons are each made up of even smaller particles called quarks and the particle force gluons. So when we add even more energy and temperature rises, they can strip apart and the nucleus strips apart and the nucleons can actually um, melt and we get kind of a C or a soup called the quark gluon plasma because protons and neutrons are made out of even smaller particles called quarks and gluons and um, at high temperatures and energies they break apart and run free creating the quark gluon plasma and that's another state of matter. So to go back to our original graphic we have the big bang which was many, many times hotter than our universe today. We have temperatures that are trillions of degrees and really high densities. So at those high densities, photons can't really escape. And if we don't have light to help us explore this region of space, then we can't gather it with our telescopes, right? Um, so we can really explore our universe using light, we now are into um, a new era of astronomy where we have uh, multiple ways of exploring the universe. We can explore it with gravitational waves and we can explore particles too. But when we're exploring things like the Big Bang, um, the it was just so dense again that the photons didn't really um, reach or be able to escape that area and we weren't, be able, we weren't able to study it. So how can we really explore something we can't see? And to help us explore the quark gluon plasma and this, um, this uh, really energetic um, time of the universe, we have our special guest, Dr. Michael Scobie, to help us out. So Michael, I'm going to go ahead and um, stop sharing my screen and let you unmute yourself, turn on your video, and start with your part of the presentation. I'm really excited for it. Um, so welcome, Michael, and uh, take it away. OK. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, so uh, as uh, Dana mentioned, I'm going to be talking about 
uh, the quark gluon plasma and how it's created in um, experiments here on Earth, specifically in relativistic heavy ion collisions. Um, I'm also going to talk about how we actually observe what happens in these collisions. And then finally, we'll talk about um, how we can characterize the matter that's created and understand the properties of the quark gluon plasma. Uh, so what are relativistic heavy ion collisions? Well, the heavy ion part is typically a nucleus of gold. So this is where all the electrons are stripped off of a gold atom. And it can also be uh, copper or lead or uranium. And the relativistic term refers to the fact that these ions are accelerated to speeds that are so large they can be described by Newton's, excuse me, by Einstein's theory of relativity. So the speeds that they reach are close to the speed of light. They're about 99.995% of the speed of light. And these collisions are created in laboratories here on Earth. There's one in Europe called the Large Hadron Collider. Um, but the one I'm going to be talking about today it's called the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. Um, we call it RIC for short. And this is located at Brookhaven National Lab, located on Long Island, New York. The overall idea here is that we want to uh, smash together the ions and liberate the quarks and gluons that make up the nucleons in the ions. So the, the way this happens is a beam of gold ions, for example, is created. And they are injected into two separate rings. And this is, these are called the Rick rings. There is a yellow ring and a blue ring. So a, a beam of heavy ions is injected into the yellow, beam, yellow pipe in one direction. And then a separate beam is injected into the blue pipe in the opposite direction. So you have two ions moving at relativistic speeds in opposite directions. But you'll notice at points located around this ring, the beams are crossed. And it's when they cross at these intersection points, the ions uh, collide with each other. And we have de particle detectors that are centered around where these collisions take place. Um, to measure the stuff that comes out. So you'll notice two experiments are labeled here. There's the Phoenix experiment and the star experiment. You'll notice between the two experiments, there's this blue ring that's on the outside. And then the yellow pipe is on the inside. However, after they cross at star, for example, then the yellow pipe is now on the outside and the blue one is on the inside. And this happens all the way around the ring um, because they are crossing at these six different intersection points. So kind of the way we can think about this, if you want to imagine um, you want to see the inside of two remote control cars, one way you could do that is accelerate them to really high speeds and collide them head on. And when they collide, they're going to um, have an explosion of the fenders and the wheels and maybe the motor, et cetera. And it's kind of the same principle here. We want to smash them together at high speeds and see what's inside. Um, but before I talk about how we actually observe what's happening in these collisions, I want to show you a uh, simulation of what a collision might look like. So as I mentioned, these ions which are shown here are accelerated to speeds close to the speed of light and therefore they undergo effects that are described by Einstein's theory of relativity. Specifically here they experience length contraction and what that means is you have a otherwise uh, spherical heavy ion such as gold and when it's accelerated at speed it contracts into something that looks more like a pancake. So that's why you see these two heavy ions that look like pancakes right before the collision. 
So the, the one on the left is coming from the left side, the one on the right is coming from the right side, and this is just before they collide. So let me play the video to show you what the collision might look like. So you have these heavy ions that are made out of the protons and neutrons. At the very beginning, you can see the smaller spheres, which are the, let me uh, slow it down here so we can uh, look at what's happening. So you have these smaller spheres that are the protons and neutrons. Now, as they approach each other and the collision begins, the quarks and gluons that are inside the protons and neutrons start to interact with each other. And because they're coming at such high speeds, there's a lot of energy being deposited in that collision. So as we progress a little bit more, you start to see all of these particles coming out. So you, you might wonder, if we're starting off with just protons and neutrons, how do we get all of these particles? Are these particles inside the protons and neutrons? Well, the answer is not quite. What's actually happening is when quarks, for example, interact with each other, they experience a force called the strong force. And it's called the strong force because it binds nucleons together, but also when you try to separate two quarks, the, the force between them gets stronger. As you put more and more energy into it and pull them apart, the force gets even stronger. These two quarks will never break apart if you keep pulling, a, pulling on them. Instead, what happens is they create two quark pairs in between them. So now you have four quarks. Now you put more energy into the system, you pull them apart. These two quarks then make a quark pair and then and so on and so forth. So if you put enough energy into the system, you're going to get this long string of quarks. And if you have enough nucleons to distribute the quarks throughout the system, you're going to have all of these quarks that are floating around and they're going to recombine to create new particles. So these yellow tubes that are shown in the simulation, those don't actually exist. They're just a representation of this uh, strong force between quarks. So after these quarks are created um, by, by pulling, out to, uh, pulling apart other quarks, they recombine and they make thousands of other particles. So for example, these little green spheres, those are a, a new particle called a pion that wasn't originally in the heavy ions. It was created by this recombination of all the quarks that we made in the collision. And these blue ones are kaons, and there's also um, antiparticles that are created, but these are the most um, common particles created. So this simulation gives us an idea of what uh, the collision might look like. And um, what ultimately what we're trying to do is understand the matter created um, in the collision. So actually just before the particles are created. In this simulation, this can happen in any heavy ion collision. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be one in which the quark gluon plasma was created. So to understand the matter that's created, we need to understand the particles that are coming out so we can extrapolate back and understand the system that was created in the collision. So to do that, we need to measure the particles coming out of the collision. And the detector that I'm gonna focus on today is called the star detector. There are, as I mentioned, there are other experiments located at the Large Hadron Collider in Europe. And there used to be one at RIC, which was called Phoenix. Um, but star is the one that's operational today. And so I'm gonna focus on this one. So, the star detector is actually a collection of many detectors, particle detectors. And the primary one is called the time projection chamber. And that's this large cylinder that you see in the middle of the detector. And it topped off by this end cap that has sectors built in. And 
it's about four meters in diameter and it's about 4.2 meters in length. So it's a very large cylinder. Um, and it's centered right where those beams cross and where the collision happens. The chamber is filled with an ionizing gas. And the ionizing gas is used to track the trajectory of the particles that come out of the collision. So you, we have a collision, for example, of gold on gold that occurs in the middle of our detector. And all these particles that I showed in the previous simulation fly out from the collision. The charged particles, they will knock electrons off of that ionizing gas. And those electrons are pushed towards the end cap. So they're pushed down here by an electric field that we apply along the length of the cylinder. So again, a charged particle will knock electrons off of the gas that's in the chamber. Those electrons are pushed by an electric field to these end caps. And it's on these end caps where those electrons deposit a signal, and that's what we measure. Um, I'll show you that in more detail on the next slide. But before that, I also want to mention that the time projection chamber is surrounded by this large magnet. And that magnet helps us determine whether the charge of the particle is positive or negative, depending on the curvature of the track. So let me show that here on the next slide. So here we have the time projection chamber hits. So these are the electrons that hit the end cap of that large cylinder. On the left side, we have cosmic rays. So these are rays that are charged particles that come from space. They interact with their atmosphere, creating other particles. And they literally come down through the roof of our detector. And they go right through the gas chamber. So this has nothing to do with the heavy ions. This is just when the detector is on. And these particles come from space and through the detector. We can use this to calibrate the detector and make sure it's working before we actually collide heavy ions to make the measurements that we're interested in. Uh, so there's a couple of things I want to point out. So if a charged particle is moving through the detector very, very fast, the influence of the magnetic field on that charge is relatively small. So it'll appear like the particle is going almost in a straight line. If the, if the charge is going very slow, the magnetic field will have a larger impact. And so it will um, bend the charge even more. And so the, um, the path of that particle will look like a circle. Um, so, on, so that's the cosmic rays. On the right is a, um, the hits from a heavy ion collision. So you can see that um, we have thousands of tracks created here. And this is due to all the particles. So again, a, the chamber is filled with a gas. A particle goes through the chamber and knocks electrons off of the gas. And then the electric field pushes those electrons to this end cap. And these, if you look very closely, you might be able to see these really tiny blue dots that make up these tracks. And those tiny blue dots are the actual uh, signal that the electrons deposit on the readout electronics. So you see this very a dense collection of tracks near the center because that's where all the particles are coming out. And, out, and then obviously it, it thins out as it um, goes out farther. If you look really close, you can see that some of the tracks bend one way and some of the tracks bend the opposite direction. And that's how we distinguish between a positive charge or a negative charge. So this gives us a really good two dimensional view of what these tracks look like. But in reality, these tracks are moving, moving in three-dimensional space. So if we want to completely reconstruct the path that these particles take, then we also have to know 
the position of these electrons relative to inside, if you look um, at the picture, relative to going into the screen or out of the screen. And we can do that knowing the speed of the electrons and how long it takes for them to hit the end cap. Um, so we do that and we take this into account and then we can reconstruct all of the particles that come from a collision. So what I'm gonna show you is a 3D simulation of the time projection chamber. That's this skeleton looking thing. This middle cylinder is the beam pipe. That's where you have an ion coming from the left and the right, and then they collide in the center. Um, it's a little bit, dis the image is a little bit distorted because this was intended uh, for the planetarium. So, um, but it, it does a great job nonetheless. So um, this system is rotating for uh, a point of reference. The, the explosions you're seeing in the middle, that's where the heavy ions come together and collide. So this again is just taking those electron hits that I showed you on the previous slide using timing information to get the dimension going into the screen as the uh, TPC comes around. And that gives us all three dimensions that we need in order to reconstruct all the tracks. So we have um, explosions that look like there are thousands of particles. We have some that look like there's only a few hundred particles and then yet some that look like there's maybe 10 particles. And the reason for this is when the heavy ions come in and collide, um, we can't control how much they collide, how much overlap there is. So if you think about the remote control car analogy again, if two remote control cars are coming together and they just barely swipe each other, you might see a piece of one of the fenders come off. Um, you won't see much debris at all. But if they come in and hit each other head on, then you'll see an explosion of uh, pieces coming off of the, the cars. And the idea here is very similar. So you see the heavy ions come in. If they barely miss each other, you might see 10 particles. And we call those peripheral collisions. But if they're head on, there's going to be a large deposit of energy in the center. And it's going to create all those particles that I showed you in that previous simulation. And then there's going to be a big explosion of thousands of particles um, that come out of the collision. So this is a lot, this might look like a lot of chaos. So you see tracks going everywhere. They're bent in every which way coming from all sides. How can we make any use of this information? Well, the, the types of collisions that we're especially interested in are those head-on collisions that I mentioned. Because in order to make the quark gluon plasma, you need a system that's very hot and very dense. So you get the most amount of energy deposited in the collision when they're head on. So the ones that we're really interested in are the ones where there are thousands of particles. We have to distill all of this data to make sense of it uh, so we can understand the type of matter that's created in the collision. And to do that, we have to measure things that can be compared to theoretical models because we're not actually seeing what's happening in the collision. We're not seeing the quarks interact with each other. We're only seeing the particles that are created after the fact. So we have to use theoretical models to interpret what this means. So we're very interested in making measurements that can be compared to theoretical expectations. So the things that we look for are um, things such as particle flow, which tells you how the energy is distributed out of the collision. And we can look at the tracks of the particles to get an idea of what the geometry of that collision actually looked like. We also look for something called jets. So a jet, um, which will be important um, on the next slide, is a stream of particles created by a high energy quark. 
So you have a, a quark with high energy in this collision. Um, it makes a jet of particles. So it's distinguished from the other particles because it's a, a stream of particles. Um, and because you need to con conserve momentum, there's going to be a jet in the opposite direction. So we look for jets. We also look for correlations between particles because that can tell us how they're related early on in the collision. And there are um, models that can um, tell us stuff about the collision based on the ratio of particles. So I showed you before there were thousands of pions and there were some kaons in that simulation. Well, the ratio of some of those particles um, are predicted by certain models. So by measuring these things that are experimental, concrete things we can measure, and then interpreting them with the theoretical models will help us understand what the medium was like um, after the collision. And most importantly, did we make something like the quark gluon plasma or something else? So finally, um, let's talk about what uh, we've learned and what the quark gluon plasma behaves like in relativistic heavy ion collisions. There are several signatures that you look for um, to see if, whether or not you made the quark gluon plasma. A lot of them are uh, complex and uh, I won't cover them today, um, but there are a few important things that I wanna to touch on. So we talked about how the density and temperature of the matter has to be really um, high density, really hot. How do we know if that was uh, created in our experiment? Well, temperature in general is just a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in the matter that you're interested in. So for example, if you measure the temperature of uh, air or the temperature of water, you're really just measuring the average kinetic energy of the particles in those substances. So we can do something similar to the medium that we create in relativistic heavy ion collisions. The Phoenix experiment that I mentioned before, they have a way of measuring photons, which are just light particles that were created early on in the collision. These photons are called direct photons because they don't interact with the medium and they don't interact with the charged particles that are created afterward. They go straight to the detector. And so by measuring the energy of those direct photons, we can measure the average energy early on in the collision and therefore the temperature. And it turns out that indeed the temperature that's measured in, in these collisions, um, these head-on collisions are more than hot enough to uh, create the quark gluon plasma. So they're much greater than the temperature needed to, to create it. Um, so we know it's hot enough. We can also uh, get an idea of, the of what the density of the medium might be by using uh, jets as a probe. So I mentioned on the uh, previous slide that jets are streams of particles created by, the, uh, by quarks. And so if you have a stream of jets going that way to conserve momentum, you have to have a stream of jets going in, in the other direction. If there was nothing in the medium, so if it was dense, if it was less dense or there was nothing there, then you would expect to see a jet coming out one direction and a jet coming out the opposite direction. However, if there is a dense medium and you, have, you happen to have a jet that's created on the surface of that medium, so that's what is shown in this diagram here. This big yellow and red thing is the uh, fireball created in the collision. So if you have this jet that happens to be created on the surface, you'll see one jet with all of its energy and momentum come out. But the jet that you expect to see come out the other end is going to interact with the particles in the fireball. 
And when it's interacting with those particles, it loses energy. So by the time these particles reach the other end of the fireball, they've lost most or all of their energy. And therefore, you don't see a jet coming out the other end. So we can use these jets as a probe to understand the medium that's created in these collisions. And this phenomenon where the jet coming out the other end loses all of its energy is called jet, jet quenching, which indeed has been observed in relativistic heavy ion collisions at RIC. Uh, so those are the primary properties that we're looking at is the temperature and density. And in 2005, the quark gluon plasma was dis discovered at RIC. Um, the, one of the more interesting things that was discovered about the quark gluon plasma is that it actually behaves more like a liquid. And we call it a perfect liquid. And the reason is because the, the plasma was predicted to have the quarks and gluons weakly interacting with each other within the soup, kind of like a plasma, like how a nucleus and electrons interact weakly or not, not at all. However, what was discovered is that the quarks and gluons when they make the when they make the medium, they are liberated from the protons and neutrons. However, they interact strongly with each other. So even though they're liberated from the nucleons, they're still bound together, interacting strongly with each other. And this is more like a liquid. So that was one of the surprising finds of the matter that is created in these collisions. Um, and it's called a perfect liquid because there is a lower bound to the viscosity that's possible. If you think of viscosity as being how easily a liquid flows, um, molasses has a high viscosity because it flows very slowly, whereas water flows more easily, it has a lower viscosity. So the corcoline plasma actually reaches the lower limit, the lowest possible viscosity. Um, and so therefore it's called a perfect liquid. So those are, that's the quark gluon plasma and relativistic heavy ion collisions. Um, we're still learning a, a lot about it all the time. And there's uh, much more to learn for years to come. And um, it's gonna be an exciting time for understanding the state of matter. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Michael. That was really interesting. Um, I, particle physics is one of the things that I studied as an undergrad in physics. And so it's still, um, something that really interests me, especially how it relates to astronomy. So thank you again. Uh, so if anyone has a question, um, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll get it to Michael here. We'll do our best to answer it. Uh, but of course, I have my own questions. And uh, one of my questions that I have is, what have scientists found so far exploring these collisions? Have they discovered anything new or interesting? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, the, the fact that it was more like a, a liquid rather than um, a plasma is one of the most interesting things. And the fact that it has the lowest limit to uh, viscosity that's possible. Um, we've also found in these collisions exotic nuclei. So there are um, antiparticles that are created in these collisions. And sometimes those antiparticles, like proto antiprotons, antineutrons, will combine to make an antinucleus. So there have been um, a helium-3 anti, anti-helium-3 nucleus created. Um, there's um, other smaller uh, exotic particles like that have been created. Uh, one another interesting thing that was found is that the the um, temperature at which all of these particles are created, that is when all of the quarks and gluons recombine to make these particles, we found that that is a universal temperature for um, for everybody, mm. uh, for everything in the in the collision, um, and the time that it takes for the system to evolve was found to be very fast. So the time that the, uh, the medium exists 
is about one billionth of one billionth of one millionth of a second. So very short lifetime. Um, and, and we have the technology that can actually measure that small time. Uh, so the technology doesn't directly measure that time. We, so we measure the particles that are coming out and then we use models to calculate what that uh, time length is. Yeah, to kind of infer from that other data. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I was gonna say it'd be really impressive if we had the tech to <laughs> um, actually measure that directly. So what kind of information um, or how does this information and how do these experiments help us in maybe our everyday lives? Like how does this affect you and me when we're just uh, working from home, which we are here yeah. in this pandemic? Yeah, so there, uh, I would say right now there isn't a direct impact. Um, however, research often will show new discoveries that um, uh, inspire new technologies. So uh, one example is the discovery of the electron, which was discovered in the late 1800s. And it, um, wasn't that well understood, um, but eventually we were able to design computers because we understood what an electron is and how it behaves. Without that understanding, without that discovery, we wouldn't have modern day computers or electronics. Um, so it's like there you never are, know what's going to come out of it. Exactly. They, they had no idea then what a computer was yeah. going to look like. So right. discoveries today will. Um, inspire the technology of the future. Um, yeah, and I think that's an important thing though, that we, I think a lot of people are really interested in knowing the answers and having concrete, you know, solutions or evidence for certain things. And I think that, you know, the, the really wonderful thing about science is that it's okay not to know everything. And it's okay that we don't yet know what this is all going to impact in the future. Exactly. It's still a wonderful investment. Mm -hmm. And I'll say that there have been some um, indirect contributions to your everyday life that experiments like this have made. For example, the, um, the internet got off the ground because uh, yeah. physicists in Europe wanted to have a way to quickly send data to physicists in the US. And so they used the internet to do that. Um, there's, it also pushes, uh, computing technology in some cases, because um, for a long time, these kind of experiments have produced, have produced the largest data sets in the world. And so we need, we needed companies to develop very fast computing and storage capabilities. Yeah. Okay, so um, I have to ask, when these collisions are happening, we are creating these extreme temperatures, how does that not melt the accelerator itself? So the, uh, so the heavy ions, as they accelerate around the ring, um, they emit radiation that the beam pipes can withstand. When the actual collision happens and we're, we have uh, temperatures that are um, hot enough to create the quark gluon plasma, the reason it doesn't melt the detector is because the system lasts for a very short period of time and is very small. I already mentioned the, the length of yeah. the um, existence of the medium. And then the size of it is about one billionth of one millionth of a meter across. So it's very small, very short lived. And what actually reaches our detectors are the particles and not the actual um, quark gluon plasma. And these particles have already um, cooled down in order to coalesce into the particles themselves. And so they don't melt. Yeah, the, and they're quite small, right? Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. like you said, a, what, a billionth of a millionth of a meter um, for the larger structure there. And then the particles are much, much smaller than that. Right, yeah. Um, okay, so how do, how do these small things that can withstand such high temperatures and pressures go into creating such fragile, human beings, because uh, we're quite sensitive to temperature, to mm -hmm. extreme pressures. We like it, you know, our environment here on earth with, you know, what, 
um, with our um, atmospheric pressure that we're used to. Yeah. Uh, so how, how does, I don't know, it's just really interesting to think that we have, we're made of really strong things, uh, mm -hmm. but yet we're really sensitive to temperature and pressure. Right. So the uh, early universe was very, very hot. Obviously, we wouldn't be able to stand those temperatures. Um, but they cooled down. So the quarks and gluons cooled down to make the protons and neutrons. And then protons and neutrons came together to make um, nuclei. And uh, they made uh, stars. And um, you have the uh, progression to making us. So uh you yeah. know the temperatures of the quarks and gluons obviously aren't uh, that high now because they've cooled down in order to make the matter that we're made of and it takes more energy to uh, like kind of break things apart right um mm -hmm. so things held with gravity together by gravity aren't it's not as strong of a force than the other forces that we have holding together other things so we're held together by these these forces that are more sensitive than the ones that are keeping together the objects and particles that make us up, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. So the uh, so one thing I didn't go into detail about was uh, if you think about a, a nucleus, it may, is made out of protons and neutrons, and the protons have positive charge. The neutrons have no charge. And we know that uh, charges with opposite sign attract, but charges with the same sign repel. So if the nucleus is made of all positive charge, then why doesn't it just fly apart? And the reason is that the quarks and gluons inside the nucleons are held together by something called the strong force. And it's also called the nuclear force because that force can interact across the protons and neutrons. And that ult ultimately, ultimately is what keeps the nucleus held together. And that is that force, unlike gravity, where that force gets uh, weaker as the gravitational objects separate, the strong force gets stronger as the quarks and gluons uh, separate. So it's um it's that property of that force it being very strong and getting stronger as you pull, pull, pull them apart is what binds the nucleus together yeah. and of course makes everything that we see it's really interesting and it, it's really important to understanding our entire universe so thanks again uh for helping us exp uh, understand a little bit about the experimental aspect of mm -hmm. cosmology because you know it's really hard to recreate these conditions in a lab but we're doing it so it's really interesting to hear about it from you um working on all that so thanks again for for hanging Thank out with you. us and uh answering all my questions i have many more but we'll chat later i'm sure okay all right. Well, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. If you have any questions, if you're watching this later, go ahead and put them in the chat for either Michael or myself, and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, but thanks everyone for tuning in to our Your Universe series. We spent a lot of weeks with you all exploring our universe. We didn't get to everything though. So next month, we're going to be posting a couple of the things that we didn't get to. Um, so we're going to maybe do a couple posts about open star clusters, what those are, rogue planets. Uh, maybe we'll go into the expansion of the universe, which we really didn't get a touch on, and things like dark matter and dark energy. So if you have anything that you want to, to explore during our Your Universe series that we didn't get to, put it in the chat too. We'll do another post soon to get some feedback on that too. Uh, but keep following us. We have a lot more to explore in the universe together. Uh, but we're going to take a little bit of a break before our uh, next series starts in the fall. All right, everyone, take care. Have a wonderful and peaceful weekend. See you all later.